Buenos días a todas y a todos y bienvenidos y bienvenidas a esta última sesión del seminario doctoral Paz y Valores Europeos como posible modelo de integración y progreso en un mundo global. Eh, la sesión estará presidida por el profesor Jürgen Elber. Es Cátedra Yamonet de Historia Europea de la Universidad de Colonia, en Alemania. Es además eh, miembro del jurado de la Universidad Sofía Corradi y director de este seminario. Profesor Jürgen Elber, le doy la palabra. Y el director de este seminario. Sí, amigos y amigos, bienvenidos a la final um, lab de nuestra conferencia. Our first speaker will be Maria Pia Di Nonno. Maria Pia Di Nonno is a PhD student in history of Europe at La Sapienza, the big one, the big one, the one and only, uh, of Rome. And uh, in 2040, she was awarded the prestigious prize Giacomo Matteotti by Presidenza del Concilio di Ministri for her thesis on the political thoughts of Adriano Olivetti. You've got the floor. Thank you. First of all, just let me say that it's an honor for me to receive this grant, and, but it's also a big responsibility towards the Commission, the Fundación Academia Europea de Juste, but also towards the Italian government. In fact, a part of these grants was supported by the Italian government to recognize the role of Sofia Corradi, but also to remember the young uh, students, Erasmus students, that died last year in a terrible accident. So I want to remember also these students. I will talk today about the founding mothers of Europe, and I have divided this speech in four parts. The first part is going to be a very short overview about some of these figures. The second part will be a focus on the history of Sofia Corradi and Simone Weil. And the third part will be a conclusion. And at the end, if we have time, I will talk, I will talk you to you about a project that I'm carrying about the founding mothers of Europe. So, I wanted to begin by showing you this, this picture. It is a journal and uh, it was published after the treaties of, after the uh, important sign of the treaties of Rome that, as you know, uh, it was organized in the spectacular Sala delle Orazzi e de Quiriazzi in Rome on the Capitol Hill. And one of the journalists reported an article with this title, a new big op for 116 millions of men. And the question now was, but where were finished the women? The women who were very active during resistance, who had fought and struggled for European values. They were finished here in the dustbin of history. It's a very nice book published by an uh, English cartoonist, Jacqueline Fleming, titled, titled A Trouble with the Women. And you can see these women trying to escape by helping each other from this dustbin or history. So my thesis, the aim of my thesis is that to help them to escape from this dustbin. But by the way, it's not just an ironic topic. Also, Eleanor Roosevelt talked about that in a famous letter addressed to the women of the world, and it was presented in London in 1946. And Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt affirmed in this letter to recognize the process women have made during the world and to participate actively in their effort to improve the standard of life in their own countries in the pressing work of reconstruction so that there will be qualified women ready to accept responsibility when new opportunities arise. And another woman that talk about this topic, I will talk, talk to you about her letter, is Ursula Hirschman. 
She was the wife of Altiero Spinelli before of Eugenio Colorni, and she had a very big role because she brought the Manifesto Ventotene in Italy. But I will talk to you about her later, and she is the first founding mothers of Europe that I found. And Ursula Hirschman was invited in 1975 to, to have a speech in Milan, and the uh, title of her speech was Women in the Struggle for Europe. And she said, as it always happens during rebellious stage against authoritarian regimes or during liberation struggle, women have always played a vital role in Italy during this moment because their physical involvement in battles made them equal to men before the enemy. This heritage needs to be refreshed in the contemporary memory as it was partially lost after the liberation and the so-called return to normality that in our specific case also meant the normalization of women's subalternity in society. So after these short... Okay, uh, we use this one. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about nine figures about. The first one is Louis Weiss. Louis Weiss inaugurated the first uh, meeting of the European Parliament elected for the first time by universal suffrage in 1979. She was a French journalist, she traveled around Europe, she founded in the, la, the review La Europe Nouvelle, and also she founded a Pierce Courses from title uh, La Nouvelle École de la Paix and many other things. Here you can see her biography. They are about six volumes written in a very complicated French. And on the other side there is a picture because I bought all these books on the internet and likely I received this book with the original sign of Louis Weiss. So I'm very glad of that. Later, we can also discuss about this figure. Now I'm just talking very, very few. Ada Rossi, as Ursula Hirschman, was the latter career Ventotene. She brought the Manifesto Ventotene in Italy, and she was very active in a resistance. Do you? OK. Ada Rossi brought as Ursula Hirschman. Can I? No? Not the translator. They cannot listen to me? OK, so I will talk like that. Ada Rossi brought, as Ursula Hirschman, the Manifesto of Ventotene in Italy. She uh, also was very active in the movement Giustizia e Libertà, Freedom and, and Justice. And here you can see some letters that Ernesto Rossi, he was among the author of the Manifesto of Ventotene, wrote to her. And you can find this letter in the European archives. As you can see, Ernesto Rossi loved to draw, to draw and all these letters present some images like that. Maria de Runterichte Iervolino was among the 21 women elected at the Euro Italian Constituent Assembly and she also struggled for peace, women, and Southern Italy. In a wonderful speech titled, Women, she said, women who want Europe, such as a cultural and human entity, have to be conscious that without their adhesion and collaboration, any community defined by some papers and not by the earth could not be able to survive. European civilization is greatly in debt to women culture. Instead, okay. Instead, she is Ursula Hirschman. I told something about her. She brought the Manifesto Ventotene in Italy, and among in addiction, she was among the organizer of the first meeting of the European Federalist Movement. It was established in Milan in 1914. And here you can see her biography. And uh, the other picture showed Ursula Hirschman during the meeting, the first meeting 
of the group of women of Europe. It was a group of women that wanted to make listen their voices in European affairs, and the group was established in 1975. Sophie Scholl, I really like this figure, even though she died when she was very young, because she could not see the signatory of the Treaties of Rome, but she really fought to create a better Europe. She was killed because she disseminated leaflets about peace, European Federation, and uh, so I think that her testimony as the other member of the group, the Weisse Rose, the White Rose, is still an example for all young Europeans. Eliana Vogelporski, I don't know if someone of you already read something about her. She was the supporter of the direct applicabil applicability of Article 119 of the Treaties of Rome on equal pay on women and men. And she is not very known, but she did a great work. And uh, here you can see a picture. I've taken this picture in the house of the nephew of Eliana Vogelposki, because last year I went to Brussels to attend a conference. A surprising. One of my friends reserved the apartment of the nephew of Eliana Vogelposki. So I took this picture at her house. Pausta Desorm Lavalle was an official at the European Commission. She worked for the Directorate for Information, and in particular, she was responsible for press and information of women. She organized many activities, initiatives. Here you can see the review. Uh, Femme pour l'Europe, Women for Europe, it was translated in all the languages of the European Economic Community, and she did a great work, and in fact, uh, she also helped with the election of 1979, so she had a really big role. The last one, Maria Fabrizia Badel Glorioso, she was Italian, she died this year, but the press was not very interesting in this uh, news, but she was the first woman of Europe because she was the president of the Economic Social Committee before Simone Weil, so she had a very big role and she was an Italian uh, unionist, a trade unionist. So, now we are on the topic, the real topic of this paper. I'm going to talk to you about Simone Weil and Sofia Corradi. But why did I choose these two women? Because Sofia Corradi and Simone Weil had very different life, career, experiences. But they were motivated by the same values. Protect Europe, European values, peace, freedom. And it's also the uh, aim, the motivation, the mission of the Fondazione Accademia Europea de Juste. And in fact, they both received the prestigious prize Carlo V. And I'm going to share with you also the motivation of the jury that selected Simone Weil on 19, on, no, 28. She's a fighter and creative in the way she conducts politics. She's a woman now for a clarity regarding the world of ideas and who who anonymously received this award in recognition of her courage and tenacity. It's then, eight years later, another woman received the same prize, Sofia Corradi, last year. And the motivation of the jury was her career and, above all, her great commitment and contribution to the process of European integration by means of the design and implementation of the Erasmus Initiative of the European Union, as well as her work on behalf of academic mobility, focusing on the young European students as a guarantee of tomorrow and the future of Europe. And in addiction, there is also another motivation because I chose to talk to you about them. And here, there is the motivation. This year is a year of celebration of anniversary, and uh, 
we have the anniversary of the Treaties of Rome and the anniversary of the Erasmus program. On one side, you can see some pictures that, that I've taken because I participate in the March of Europe. Uh, here you are in Rome, near Circo Massimo, near also Colosseum. And the other pictures are taken from the presentation of a Carta of Erasmus students. I was the coordinator of a panel about local communities and digital world. And the first meeting of this group of about 200 students was organized in Rome on the Capitol Hill. After that, the students were divided in six groups and we continued to talk in an online platform. We realized this manifesto that you can also download and maybe it could be nice also to share and to uh, make similar initiative all around Europe. Ah, of course, I prepared also this slide about the House of European History, but, but I'm not going to tell uh, more about that because Anna already talked about the House of the European History, but I wanted to show you this picture because during the discussion in the panel I coordinated, many students say that they wanted more physical places where discuss and talk about Europe. So digital uh, technologies are not enough. Now, it's a short biography of Simon Dale, and, later, and after that, a short biography of Sofia Corradi. Simon Dale was born in Nice, and she had a evenly childhood. She talks in her memoirs about some good fairies complicity and harmony that gave to her the best weapons to face the world. And in fact, she was helped uh, by her joie de vivre. In fact, unluckily, on March 1944, she, ah, by the way, here you can see a picture on the beach of Nizza, and she is together with her mother, Yvonne, and her sister, Milou, Denise, and the Jeanne, her brother. So, on March, her life changed completely because she was arrested, she was sent to the Excelsior. It's an hotel in Nice, and it was used by Gestapo because it was very near to the station. And all the members of her family were arrested, and uh, she could survive, also her sister Milou but, and her sister Denise, but her father, her brother, and her mother died. An important thing is that when she arrived in Auschwitz, she, she got immediately the sense of all these unima, in, inhuman techniques, and she will never forget this experience that was also tattooed on her arms. In fact, she had this number on her arms, 78651. And also when she was president of European Parliament, she could never forget this experience. She said in a wonderful speech in Auschwitz in 2005, it was not enough to destroy our bodies. We had to lose our souls as well, our minds and our humanity. On arrival, we were deprived of all identity with a number still tattooed on our arms. We were no more than stuke pieces. So, of course, she was in favor of peace, freedom, and human rights. But even though she her joie de vivre helped her also in Auschwitz, in fact, she met a camp chief, Stinia. She was a very crude Polish woman but when Stinia saw uh, Simone Veil, she said to her, oh, you are too pretty to die here. I'm going to do something for you. And she was moved together with her sister and her mother to the subcamp of Bobrek. It was a quieter subcamp because they produced some pieces for Siemens. After the evacuation of Bobrek, she was sent to Bergebelsen. And there she met Stinia again. Stinia recognized her immediately and she helped Simone to find a job in the SS kitchen so she could better survive. And luckily, her mother died for typhus fever 
and uh, exactly one month before the liberation of the camp. And Simone would come back in Paris only on May. She also tried to come back in Nice, but her life was completely changed. So she decided to remain in Paris and she attended Science Po, the law department. And in the university, she met the love of her life, Antoine Veil, and uh, she had uh, three children. After that, in 1954, she decided to uh, start her own career because her mother, Yvonne, recommended her, you must have a proper career, you must have to be independent. In fact, her mother was graduated in chemistry, but she was forced to stop her study to follow her husband in Nice. So Simone will never forget the advices of her mother. And so she decided to begin a placement. She became a magistrate. She worked in the uh, penitentiary sector and she was very interested, of course, in condition of prisoners and female prisoner. But her husband and sons were tired about her work. It was very heavy and hard. And so she uh, left this job, but she had a brilliant career, as you can see. In particular, in 1974, Jacques Chirac appointed her Minister of Health. And later, she was uh, uh, the representative of uh, the um, party, Union Democratique Française, for the European election in 1979. She accepted immediately the proposal of Gisèle Destang because she was tired of politics. She writes in her memory, I began to feel the wear of tear of power that I had often heard described. So she was elected in July and she had a wonderful speech and she said that she talked about the challenges of peace, of freedom and challenges of prosperity and to meet the challenge facing Europe, we need a Europe capable of solidarity, independence and cooperation. After that, she had other important uh, uh, job. For example, she was again Minister of Social Affairs and uh, Health. But she was very tired about politics. In fact, she said, I never felt the, the desire to make, make career in politics and I intend to stand by my principle. Politics fascinated me, but as soon as it turned, into electioneering, I lose interest. So she decided to completely change her life. She um, began this experience uh, in the Consti Constitutional Council, the French Constitutional Council, in uh, 2008 for nine years. And in the meanwhile, she was also the president of the Fondation pour la Mémoire de la Shoah. Later, she received also a very important French recognition because she was elected in the Académie Française. It's a French institution that aimed to preserve the use of French, and she was the fifth woman to uh, receive, the sixth woman to receive this important prize. But maybe the most important recognition she could receive was that one. On the 5th of July, the President Emmanuel Macron wanted uh, to uh, recognize her with a Pantheon burial together with her husband, Antoine Veil. And her hope, I really like the speech that she had when she was awarded here. And she said, today, I'm the first woman to receive this prestigious prize and I hope that it will be just a first step and that in the next years, other women will follow me. When I came back to my past, I noticed that I had an unusual path, totally privileged. In our democratic states, many women are still discriminated. I felt like a family bee. And I never stopped to struggle against women's discrimination. In this field, there is still a lot to do. A part of her dream became reality because eight years later, Sophia received the same prize. But the other part of her hope is uncompleted. 
we have still to struggle to stop women discrimination. I'm trying to do that in the history field, but of course it's, it's complicated. Some years later, now I'm going to talk about Sofia Corradi, but it's a bit strange because Sofia is in front of me, so <laughs> be Sofia, <laughs> be quiet with me. <laughs> Here you can see some picture that I, uh, they are published on the website of Sofia Corradi, and in this website you can also download for free a book in English or in Italian, and I suggest to you to, to download it. And there is a picture of Sofia Corradi when she was a child and her mother in the other picture, Maria Pizzo, together with the little Sofia, the little Gemma and uh, Livia. And uh, she was born in Rome, but all her family came from Piemonte in the north of Italy. His father studied at the prestigious Politecnico of Turin and later, uh, later he also studied in Liegi, a l'école des mines and uh, he loved also to travel and to learn languages. And uh, her father could speak German, French, and English, and Italian, of course. And so it was a very well-educated family. Also, her mother was graduated in Turin in pedagogy and education. So the little uh, <laughs> Sofia, Gemma, and Livia, of course, continued uh, this, this heritage. In addiction, all the, um, no, I'm going to show you because her father worked here and it was, yes, I found this picture, Sofia, at the archive of uh, Ferrovie. <laughs> and let me find the, the correct name where her father worked. He was director of the laboratory for building materials of the Italian state railways. And okay, so I just wanted to show this picture to Sofia. And all the little um, daughters wanted to become a doctor. Also, Sofia wanted to become a doctor because she liked to care, care about people, but she couldn't because at that time you have to uh, obey to your parents. And only the last one, Livia, could uh, become a doctor. But Sofia, in a certain way, was able to uh, reach the same her dream because she became professor of life love learning and in addition she, she worked for Erasmus so she helped people too. So she found another way to realize her dream. So it's a message for uh, young Europeans and for all of us. By the way, she attended the law department at the University of Rome, now La Sapienza, and she had a first recognition in 1957. She obtained a scholarship, a Fulbright scholarship. In fact, Sofia, together with her sister Gemma, decided to um, make this application. And when they gave this news to their parents, their parents say, oh no, you will not go to the United States, you will go only if both of you obtain the scholarship. So they were without hope, and they decided to talk directly with Mrs. Cipriana Shelba. You can see her in the picture with the Senator Fulbright, and she was the director of Italy, Italo American Commission for Fulbright Scholarship. They went to talk with her, she uh, listened to them uh, very carefully, and they obtained both the scholarship. But Sofia didn't obtain the full scholarship, but she obtained an additional scholarship from Columbia University. So they went to uh, America. But when Sofia came back to Italy, she had, as you know, probably a very big problem with her university. And here you can read uh, what Sofia writes in her book. Her request was not only refused, she was treated with scorn and her request defined crazy. Her subsequent reflection on the issues and their awareness in particular of how profoundly and positively that period of life and study abroad had impacted her, convinced her that this opportunity should be made available to all students. Another very important experience Sofia had made was that one. She was 
the, uh, she won the ninth World Competition of International Federation of Business and Professional Women. It's, it was, but is still, a consultative organization at the United Nations. She sent an application, but she thought that it was just for a traineeship. But when she arrived in New York, she realized that he was the head of the delegation at the United Nations. And uh, in New York, she met some important people and she learned diplomatic techniques. Ruggero Orlando was an important Italian journalist and politician, learned her a lot, and in particular, Miss Patterson. He was an old trade unionist, and Miss Patterson always recommend to Sofia, Sofia, do it conventionally. So it's not just for a joke, but it was a really great experience because when she became consulted or consultant of the Association of Italian Rectors later conference, she could obtain what she wanted because she had this experience. She knew that also people with no real power can have uh, an impact. So it's a, an advice for all, all of us. <laughs> and of course, she, she began to work about that. She, she wrote this memorandum, it's the most important document. And in this memorandum, the title was Equivalence of Years of University Studies Carried Out of Italian Students in Foreign Universities. She talked about the concept of equivalence. And I will tell you later the difference between equivalence and recognition. But it was very important. And she had prepared this memorandum for an important meeting, the German-Italo uh, meeting. And uh, this commission, the aim of this commission was to make possible for students of both countries to carry out a period of university study abroad, which be fully recognized by the home university. So this meeting was organized in Etlinberg, I don't know if I say Etlinberg, Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe on November 1969. And later in the same year, there was another meeting, the French Italo Commission. And here you can see uh, an article about this meeting. On the other picture, you can see the minister Agradi, and uh, it's important also to understand the context uh, because uh, there were a lot of student demonstrations, students wanted to have personalized curricula, and so rectors of our university began to talk and to, to work about that. We don't have a lot of time, I will go a bit, a bit uh, quick, but what I wanted to say to you that as we can see, Erasmus represents a very important point. His, his success was uh, the um, co collaboration, the cooperation between vertical and horizontal uh, way. And in fact, it was a bottom-up process that important. And in fact, there is a difference between equivalence and recognition. Equivalence is a process that started from the state. Extended recognition is a process that started from university. In fact, Sofia told us the first day, but also Edith, that there were different types of mobility. And for example, UNESCO and also the Council of Europe already prepared some agreements about that, but did not have any success because it was a bottom, a top-down process. And okay, these are the first recognition Sofia received. And uh, there are some letters from uh, two president of the Association of Rectors. The first one is uh, Alessandro Faedo. And Alessandro Faedo wrote her a letter and he said to her, Dear Miss Corradi, I read your article in Repubblica and I would like to participate in the satisfaction you must feel at seeing your education dream come true as you explained it many times to me at to the conference of rectors. The other letter was written by Vincenzo Bonocore, and he wrote, what today is called the Erasmus program is truly your creation, whose foundation you have actively committed yourself for many years. After that, Sofia, of course, received many recognition, 
oh, sorry, many recognition, the prize shall the fifth, the prize Alfonso El Sablo, the, pri the prize of Commendadore al Merito of Italian Republic. It's a very important recognition, but I think that her greatest joy is to be with us today. I think so. And in addiction of March, she was invited to talk at the meeting of presidents of European Parliament for the celebration of Treaties of Rome and the Erasmus. And I'm going to finish by reading a part of her speech. I'm often asked, I conceived the idea initially. It came, it came to me when, returning from a year study at New York Columbia University, I was very rudely refused recognition of the credits for study carried out in New York, where I had been granted a master in comparative law. When you are young, you want to change the world. And since I realized that a year abroad had benefited me so much, I wanted the same opportunity to be made available to many other young people. I wanted the study abroad experience, historically the privilege of few belonging to affluent families, to be made available to anyone willing to have a go. The many difficulties and the resistance encountered did not stop me, also because, as it was the era also called Cold War between the world's major powers, I consider the promotion of international student mobility as my own pacifist mission. I'm afraid that the world situation is not very different today. Now, we have just 10 minutes. I had prepared some slides, but I will be very quickly just to do some conclusion, because this history is unfinished. And I would like also to, to ask your help, uh, my colleagues, because we need a joint commitment and to continue the res this research. So I really need your help because I can do it alone, of course. And there is a thread that connects all many women initiatives. For example, the United Nations Initiative and the European Initiative. For example, I talk about the letter of Eleanor Roosevelt, the Declaration of Human Rights, in 1946 was established also a sub-commission of the status of women, later a commission. The president of the commission, Body Backtrap, struggled to insert the definition of human rights in the Declaration of Human Rights. In 1975, there was the, um, the International Year of Women. It was followed by a decade for women. And in the same period, the European Institu institution worked a lot and just to talk to you about some, some, some aspects. For example, Ursula Hirschman organized the meeting Women for Europe. And uh, in, in the next year, it was organized by the European Commission, a conference to discuss about uh, the, um, I don't know how to say, the pool. Um, wait a little an opinion pool that was launched in 1975. And in the same year, the European Commission decided to establish two offices. One, it was about uh, the problem of women at work, and it was directed by Jacqueline Nonot. And Jacqueline Nonot said about this incredible news. At the end of 1976, it was announced the establishment within the Director General for Social Affairs, an office responsible of issues concerning women employment. It was unbelievable. Once nobody would ever ever try to make this kind of suggestion, fearing to provoke a general amusement. No one would ever dream to think this sort of project. In the same time, it was established another important office. It was directed by Fausta des Hommes La Valle, and it was for information for women. And Fausta de Somme La Valle did really a lot with women of Europe, and in particular, the first number of women of Europe that was published in 1977 reported, next year there will be a European election, Eva Voice. So she had a very important role because her office was an hub. So she was able to put all women in contact. She also launched a poster context 
the, in the middle, uh, women vote for Europe, and the contest was uh, won by a very young Flemish girl. So she launched many, many, many initiatives. Of course, also the European Parliament later, there were a lot of uh, di directives. But what I really wanted to show is that there is a connection among all these initiatives, there is really a thread. So if you find one founding mothers of Europe, probably you will find all, all of them. And I told you, this is an unfinished story, but I would like to conclude this part by reading a piece of Ursula Hirschman. It was an appeal of Ursula Hirschman at the meeting I'll talk you about, so the meeting of women of, of Europe. She affirmed, why women, in a so difficult period for our future, it has arrived the time for women to make their voices heard and to assume their responsibility. They cannot undeceive themselves. What they conquered is not irreversible. So we have to think about that. It's necessary that women take an active role in the struggle for a real European integration. They have to reach in this sector, like many others, an influence corresponded to their numerical importance and the roles that they would like to play in a society what would like to be democratic and equitable. Okay, then I almost finished. This is the project I'm carrying. It's about the founding mothers of Europe, of course. And it was an exhibition that I presented at La Sapienza University. It's in English and Italian. And you can find all the information about the conference on the website. The Italian website is completed, but on summer I will work to upgrade also the English one. And I present you also this little book, Europa, Le Madri Fondatrici dell'Europa. It's in English and Italian. This is, uh, these are the panel of the exhibition. You can download for free from the website, of course. And this is the exhibition tour. I'm very proud of the exhibition tour because now the exhibition is traveling around Italy. And I hope that in the future it could be possible also in Europe. You can see some picture. It was uh, inaugurated at the Italian Chamber of Deputies, at the Italian Presidents of Minister. And in particular, uh, I was able to brought it in some schools. For example, a Palombini School in Rome and in a school of Milano. I'm almost finished. This is an interview that I made <laughs> with Sofia in 1915, and it's a part of this book. And uh, I'm not going to read uh, what I wrote in, uh, in this part, but I just want to thank you, Sofia, because for me, she is a sort of Miss Patterson. <laughs> and I got also a present for each of you on my chair. There are some copies of this interview. This interview is still in Italian, but I think that we can also translate. And I got also a present for professors. And it's the book on the founding mothers of Europe. So you can bring this piece of me also around Europe. And inside the book, you can find also a visit card. So we can keep in contact and make incredible things together. So I just want to, to thank you. But uh, I'm waiting for your suggestion and ideas. And I just want to remark that this is an uncompleted uh, research and I need your help. So if you would like now to tell me more about One Founding Mothers of Europe, if you want to translate the website or other thing, I, I will uh, really be glad to, to continue this, this research. I finish? Oh, sorry, miss three minutes. Sorry for my Italian English, but I have to improve it. <laughs> Well, thank you, Maria. Um, that requires quite a lot of effort. I mean, it's not, not only um, liberating um, the mothers of Europe out of the dustbin of history, uh, which is a, an up, a work absolutely overdue. I mean, um, having dealt with history of European integration for a couple of decades right now, 
uh, I can only confirm so far we have only been talking about uh, the fathers of, of Europe. I always felt a bit uh, uneasy about it, but uh, when, when looking uh, at, at, at the names on the files, it's only been fathers, at least there, what I saw. But I think this approach is quite interesting, uh, just, just to look a bit uh, beyond the horizon and um, take the value aspect into consideration. Um, I think you are, you've just scratched a bit on the surface right now. There is uh, much more to dig out, I guess. Yeah. Um, so good luck for this work. I mean, <laughs> um, just organizing an, an ex exhibition just beside your, your work is also, um, well, deserves, uh, well, much recognition, I think. And uh, I do wish you uh, much success with it. Um, traveling in Italy right now, maybe even later on in Europe. Yes. Yeah, let's wait and see. Um, the floor is open for discussion. Where's the microphone? Talk quite slowly in Spanish, so I will understand. Maybe you repeat. Ah, uh, well hidden. It's over over here. Bueno, María, enhorabuena. Congratulations, María, for your contribution. On behalf of women, as a human being, as a fellow scholarship recipient, it has been a pleasure to listen to you because you have shed light to a part of history that sometimes is in the shadow, which is women, and I am thankful for that. I'm even... Um, very excited, and Sofia is here, and uh, this is very moving to me. I have one question for you. Do not worry. When I hear the news, the uh, meetings of uh, ministers, uh, EU, all types of um, uh, all sorts of meetings, I always see dark suits worn by men. So I think there is still a lot of work to be done to include women uh, within European institutions, even though we have a good example with uh, Angela Merkel. I mean, from the political point of view, regardless of their opinion. So my specific question is, do you think that that integration uh, process uh, of women in the political sphere should be top-bottom approach, that is from the EU to member states, or should EU member states the one who should consolidate uh, feminine integration and so have a bottom-top uh, approach? Which one is the best approach it's in your a very good question. We must work on both direction, from the top and from the bottom. We have to be grateful to the European Union because many women's rights were accomplished also thanks to the European institution. But on the other side, democracy is not only an European affair. Democracy starts from the bottom. So it's important to start from the bottom, with, but with, I don't know, rules, directives also from the European Union. And there is also another founding mother of Europe. I don't talk about her today also because I'm still working on her. And she is Pausta Gianni Cecchini. She worked on the Council of Municipality of Europe and she worked on this aspect. So women from the start to the top and there are a lot of initiative about that. But I'm still working on it. And if you want to help me, I can give you some information <laughs> you can continue.
Now, mine is a really short question because um, thank you for your presentation, uh, by the way. Um, how do you theoretically and empirically ground your, uh, your work? Because I'm struggling to understand. This is a really important mm -hmm. topic in, you know, in, the, in the literature. Do you gender studies, the feminist studies? How do you explain uh, theoretically? So you would like to know how, uh, which documents I use? No, and no, 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 no. I mean, like, theoretically, how do you explain your research? You know, how is the theoretically grounded? Do you uh, speak about the feminist studies? Okay. Why studying okay. women is important? So, Perfect. and methodologically, mm -mm. you know, what kind of documents do you use? What yes. kind of uh, techniques do you use? How do you analyze documents? Because you're mm -hmm. mentioning that you interview, that you visited also sites. So I'm interesting because it's a lot of documents, a lot of work, so, yes. yeah. In reality, this is not a gender, just a gender-based uh, research, because I'm talking about the founding mothers of Europe, not only because they are female, but because they are on the margin of history. In fact, in the future, I also would like to talk about other founding fathers, uh, important, that had big roles, such as, for example, Umberto Serafini, that Sofia Corradi knew. So it's just um, a research of history integration. So I'm just trying to look for documents about this female and understand how they are connected, if there is a connection among them. And in fact, the research is very difficult because sometimes do don't have archives. I, got, I found some archives at the uh, archives of the European Union in Florence but uh, for other of them, I had to make a call, find, find the colleagues, such as, for the example, of Sofia Corradi. I knew one of her friends, and I asked for her call number. So it's, it's very, 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 it's very difficult. But in fact, this research, I started it on 2014, 14, so uh, some years ago before the PhD. So it's it's very difficult. Gender representation in the in you know the uh, overall history of European integration mm -hmm. in you know building the building the EU. Well, uh, what certainly considers Simone Veil, yes. uh, there's a broad documentation in the European Parliament. Yes, yeah, yes, since she was there. Of yeah, and of course there are archives of the European Parliament as well, and you should make use of that if you mm -hmm. already didn't. Yes. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I think talking about um, approaches. Uh, methods. Uh, your uh, topic is very well suited for the agency approach. Maybe we should mm -hmm. talk about this a bit later on. Um, Jesus. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Thank you very much, Maria Pia, for your uh, presentation. Uh, I just want to suggest a name. Mm. Um, René, René Van Hoff Hafekamp. As a f the founding mother of interpreting ser the interpreting service in the European Union, I said before that uh, you know the language of Euro Europe is translation. She, uh, she was born in 1928 in Cologne, uh, mid American, mid German, and uh, she became a, uh, an interpreter. But before that, she was a secretary of Paul Henri Spack, which is very much related to the construction of of, of Europe when he was if I'm not wrong, President of the General Assembly um, in, in the United Nations, 1946. Don't quote me, but I think that was the year. And then she married a European commissioner and she became a Director General for Interpretation in the European Union. There, uh, there must be information in the European archives and, and of course she's still alive. You could also try and interview her. There are um, interviews um, in YouTube, uh, yeah. where she speaks and so on. So it's just a suggestion related to the languages and related to, in my view, one of the uh, founding mothers of interpreting in the European Union. Can you spell the name? I will give it to you, okay, don't worry. You. Yes. <laughs> and also, she played a political role because when Dolo was appointed president of the commission, mm -hmm. he, he went to speak with several uh, uh, chief of government, and he wanted to have one uh, interpret. It took René Vanoff, and he refused some uh, uh, French ones from uh, diplomacy. He wanted to, to keep all his uh, uh, totally secret. So she, she knows a lot. Yes. 
And also, we had a, a meeting with students with Simon Veil here. Mm. You have to look at the book because we will, perhaps you will find some information. Also, we had a paper mm. uh, at the beginning of the seminar about the women chief of uh, enterprise uh, from one of the ancient. Uh, and it's very important because. Uh, it, uh, we have, you have to, 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 to control. And this woman was the mother of Pascal Lamy. Thank you. And uh, one again, how can you, you have, I think, uh, how you can you link uh, the role of promoting the role of women and Europe? European integration from the beginning. I think there is a link. I think for each of them, perhaps it's quite different, but it, perhaps we have a line. So I think you have to look at very, very precisely this point. I yes. think it's very important. Yes, and I think that the answer so. to, the, the, to this question was given in a very precise way by Ursula Hirschman in another speech that I didn't read before, but it was the a description of Women of Europe. I'm looking for it. Okay. The group of Women for Europe is composed by women of nine member states of the community convinced of the necessity for women to be heard more loudly than to assume their own responsibilities and therefore also at the European women, at the European level. We know that a certain idea of Europe already exists, that a sort of Europe is in construction and we do not want to be excluded from its conception and elaboration, but the most important thing is that making Europe is a phrase without not a real meaning is stand. The important thing is to define the Europe we want. We know that actual problems cannot be resolved with the short perspective of nationalism, which are necessarily conservative. And I think that nationalism, a patriarchal view, is also the key to understand this link among women, Europe, democracy. So we have to change also the way to construct democracy. It should be a top-down and a bottom-up process, as Umberto Serratini said and affirmed. So it's important to find maybe a link on that. And it's, it, there is a link among women and the Europe integration, of course. But you have to do the job for each of them because the relationship is probably not exactly the same. And you fo in the life of uh, Simone Veil, you had a, a very uh, difficult moment was uh, when she was uh, Ministry of Health, and she promotes, uh, uh, in French, it's interruption volontaire de grossesse. It was a very strong fight, very strong fight. And you have to uh, think about the uh, uh, connection between Europe, promoting the role, the liberty of women, etc. For him, in his uh, uh, course, is very, very fundamental. You're right. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, this is the book. And it contains the paper of grants of the prize dedicated to Simon Veil. The name was his memoir and places of memory in Europe. So thank you, Miguel. OK. Maria, thank you very much for your contribution. And now you have to clap your hands. Thank you.